In this episode, I'm joined by freelancer, CEO and founder, Matt Barry. We talk about everything from the Sydney lockout laws. He actually gives me a free hat. Got a new hat. I'm loving it already. Right through to startup strategies. Matt did a successful IPO in 2013, running a company as a public company. Uh, growth as well as much, much more. This is an action-packed, content-rich episode. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to episode 227 of Ask Jack D. I am very excited by the guest we are joined by today, Mr. Matt Barry. Matt's an award-winning uh, and very well-known, successful entrepreneur, not only around Australia, but around the world. Matt's the founder and CEO of Freelancer, the world's largest freelancing marketplace, uh, where 20 million users have posted over 10 million projects and contests to date. Freelancer was listed on the ASX in 2013. Today has a market capitalization of almost $600 million. Also, Matt runs StartCon, which is Australia's largest conference for entrepreneurs and marketers. They also recently acquired Escrow, which is a payment services company similar to PayPal, only it's processed $3 billion in payments. Uh, not only all of that, but some of you may know, and Facebook's over here, by the way, as always, guys, that Matt is a very loud advocate or anti-advocate of the recent Sydney lockout laws you might have seen, he wrote a LinkedIn post in January, uh, which had a million people read it over the weekend. Matt wrote that post while skiing in Canada. Matt Barry is the only person I know that could write a blog post while skiing in Canada and have a million people read it over the weekend. Matt, right. thank you very much for joining us, mate. Thank you very much. Good to finally have you on the show. Well, thanks for, thanks for having me. Do you remember you spoke at one of our unconventions? I did. Back in, it would have been 2012, uh, it would 11? Have been 11 or 12, Yeah, uh, it was packed out. Yeah, I was. remember, I was pretty impressed. I walked in and go, gee, there's a lot of people here. <laughs> uh, and Rosalind Kogan was there. That's right. And it was, it was uh, we had a good time, it was great. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Thank you very much mm. for doing that. And thank you for coming back. No problem. We I, are pumped. I did bring you a present. You brought me a present. Yes, I did. I like presents. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Make Sydney late again. And this is what we're going to talk about <laughs> first up tonight. I'm actually going to wear this. Is that all right, Rosie? Please do. Just check with my stylist. Yeah. I'm just going to wear... That was the intention. Yeah. Make, <laughs> makes it, Matt might be offended if I don't. Make Sydney later get to talk to us about what, what happened, why did they do it, what's your stance, what's the damage that's been done with these lockout laws? Well, it's more than just lockout laws. There's a whole system of regulation uh, and so forth that's happened uh, increasingly to the centre of Sydney mm -hmm. and how it operates. Um, we have a Premier that's come in that uh, likes to pay uh, Bob the Builder. And so he's kind of you know, running around uh, selling every asset they can possibly find that's not bolted down to mm -hmm. go and build uh, new things mm -hmm. uh, all around the place. Um, on top of that, we've had um, uh, quite a large influence amongst um, in, the, in the New South Wales Liberal Party with um, evangelicals and property developers. And uh, it's a kind of a deadly combination as far as King's Cross is concerned because the property yeah. in King's Cross is obviously quite valuable. Yeah. It's right next to Woolloomooloo where you've got billions of dollars of property which ultimately will become high-rise apartments near the water. Mm. Uh, and on top of that, King's Cross has always been the area where people go out and so mm. it's the area of sin and the evangelicals don't like it. So that combination all together uh, has led to a, what I think is a kind of a fairly craftily constructed, um, you know, plan, which has been um, mm. r relatively well executed to basically shut down uh, the whole of King's Cross in order for it to be sold off. And in fact, this week we, we, we saw the, the final uh, now in the coffin for the area uh, has finally been hit because uh, there's now the remaining 65 um, properties that haven't been redeveloped into, into apartments are apparently now in a group uh, sale. Uh, rumoured for up to up, up for uh, 500 million dollars. So this is the, you know, the the complete end of, of King's Cross, and this was the game plan all along. And this naturally will unlock Willamaloo and all the development in Willamaloo. They'll probably move out all the housing commission uh, and find a way to move Matthew Talbot and so forth and yeah. um, and so on. But in the in the in the process of doing all this, there's been uh, a, a lot of collateral damage. Um, mm. The collateral damage is the city now is basically tumbleweeds. I mean, mm. I mean, you, mm. you remember what it used to be like years ago. Absolutely. Now you go out and you can't see anyone, yeah. and it's not just in the lockout affected areas. The whole consumer behaviour has changed so much now in Sydney that you can go to Bondi 
I went to some Bondi and mm. St. Patrick's Day, couldn't mm. see a single person around. Mm. You get a Leichhardt down Norton Street, all the restaurants have gone bust. The Forum, you know, and there's a bunch of issues here. It's not just lockout laws and, and, and consumer behavior. There's a whole bunch of things that, that have occurred as a result of this, where you go to the Forum, used to I think, have 18 restaurants now. It had two when I went there a few weeks ago, mm. and the second one went bust while I was there. So there's only one now. And so it just, it's the whole city now is, is dead. People at home, I think, are too busy um, at home paying off their mortgage and watching Netflix. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing you talk about the economic drivers behind the play because that's mm -hmm. obviously a side of the, the narrative that the general public, I don't think, ever saw. It certainly wasn't. Oh, well, I think uh, quite a number of people were kind of pointing out that you know, this, yeah. looks, this looks like it's, it's a little bit suspicious. I mean, yeah. the, the whole backstory here was that <clears throat> it was very unfortunate that two young men um, went out to have a good, good time uh, mm. in King's Cross mm. relatively early at night, 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, mm. um, got into a fight with someone um, who was... You know, not in the venue, um, mm. you know, running around the streets, mm. uh, hell, went, fell over, hit their head, and accidentally died. It mm. wasn't mm. premeditated murder or anything like that. It was mm. literally they hit their head in the concrete and unfortunately um, they, they passed away. Mm. Mm. But this was, this was used. Um, that was the main part of the narrative. The, 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 this the was time. used uh, under the banner of health and safety yeah. in order to kind of yeah. put a bunch of regulatory changes in, mm. uh, including changing times. But there, there's a whole sweep of changes that, that occurred over many, many, many years, mm. uh, well before the actual lockout like legislation uh, it was in place, mm. um, yeah, the ball was rolling, but um, to basically create it, an, an environment so unpalatable that businesses couldn't actually operate and, and as a result they would eventually go bust one by one by one mm -hmm. so that the property could then be sold off to developers. We will get to business in a second, but yeah. I just want to put, this is really interesting. Um, yeah. Wouldn't the lockout laws in King's Cross, for example, therefore drawing less people, wouldn't that have a downward effect on property price? Um, the, well, there were reports that some properties did have a downward effect. It really yeah. depends what the use, what the what the, the what the zone the property is actually zoned for, right? Yeah. Um, the property area, the properties that were zoned to uh, appropriately so apartments could be built. Obviously, they're worth a huge amount of money now because yeah. the whole area is is you know, so-called gentrifying. Although I don't know who's actually paying for these you know one million dollar one bedroom apartments in in, in Kings Cross <laughs> or who Cross they plan on to buy, to buy them because yeah. wages haven't haven't gone up. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And, and, and all the restaurants and cafes are going bust in the area as well. So if they're supposedly gentrifying, there's going to be nowhere to, to kind of eat. It's going to be a bit of a bit, yeah. of, a bit of an urban ghetto. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, it depends what, 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 what use. If you, if you weren't able to be zoned or haven't been zoned, then obviously that would, would be detrimental to the property prices. And I, I think your, the blog post that you wrote, there was a substantive, if anyone hasn't read it, actually, Rosie, can you find it and put it in the comments below of each of these videos? Uh, for those who haven't read, there was a substantial amount of research that went into it and it obviously hit a spot for I think all Australians who had a strong reaction to the to the initial lockout laws and the reasoning behind it and how it's since unfolded. Why do you think it resonated with so many people? Well before the article came out um, people were very confused about what, were, what was happening. Obviously mm. um, there's a number of things the government sells to us over time around health and safety. It's not just um, you know, lockout laws, it's using things like bicycle helmets and riding a bike and this or the other, health and safety, health and safety. But if you kind of, if you kind of go through um, and, and actually do your research and figure out why these, some of these laws are coming in, a lot of the time they're actually not for health and safety at all, for completely other reasons. Like for example, I, I, you probably would be completely unaware about how the federal government floats the budget at the moment, right? Because if you actually go and read the budget, uh, receipts from corporate taxes are down. Mm. Um, I think down 3.6% from memory. The receipts from income taxes are down, mm. right? Mm. And you probably won't guess how we actually float the budget. No. It's right. taxation on cigarettes. Is that right? So we make about nine, uh, the government makes about $9 billion a year mm. from taxation on cigarettes. Mm. Uh, compare that to tax on uh, super, superannuation, which is about six and a half billion from memory, and wow. tax on fringe benefits tax, which is four and a half billion, and tax on Australia's oil fields, 800 million. Tax right. on cigarettes and, is $9 and, billion. And, and the Turnbull government has now going to increase the tax on cigarettes for the next four years by, I think, 25%. So mm. this, is the th this is the only thing that, that's kind of growing, that's really floating the budget at the federal level. Mm. Of course, this is all sold to us under the banner of health and safety, mm. right? Mm. And everyone goes, well, cigarettes, cigarettes are bad for you, obviously, health and safety, et cetera. But the reality is that's how they're floating the budget. Because at, at the end of the day, if everyone stops smoking, there'll be a massive hole in the, in yeah, the federal budget. In the budget. And, and they'll have to you know, raise the price of beer to $50 a schooner or something like that in, in order to compensate. So. So the reason, reason why I think it resonated, kind of come, come back uh, to, to your mm. qu initial question, was that a lot of people were really confused. They thought, you know, are Australians really violent? And then, of course, mm. you know, if, if some of the media played up the whole um, lockout law issue because one particular publication, in fact, if you go to their, where they sell their advertising, um, they actually say that we created the lockout laws 
and that's why we are important. That's why you should advertise with us. Mm. And and it, both of the major publications um, now, um, the core business of, of of journalism and newspapers has collapsed. So you know, last year one of, one of the major publishers wrote a billion dollars off um, the value of their masthead. So they're only yeah. worth forty million dollars now. Yeah. And in fact, the only thing that's really generating real money for these businesses now are real estate classifieds. Mm. And of course, lockout laws come in, the whole of King's Cross gets redeveloped, lots and lots and lots of apartments go up, Woolloomooloo gets redeveloped, apartments go up there, mid to high rise eventually, uh, and there's a lot of stamp duty uh, for the government and land tax and so forth, and there's also a lot of listings and classifieds that go yeah. into these uh, real, uh, effectively real estate publications. Yeah. So, um, you know, Everyone's very confused. Everyone was really upset. You'd go out mm. one minute. I mean, living in Sydney in the last few years is like playing a computer game on maximum difficulty, right? You, you go out, you go to your favorite venue, and it's closed. And it's, why is it closed, right? And you go, okay, fine. <laughs> then you go to the next venue. You go, it, it's exactly what it's like. You go to the next venue, and all of a sudden, you're forced to drink out of plastic cups. You go, I, never, I, never had, I was never forced to drink out of a plastic cup before, but for some reason, now I've got to bring out a plastic cup, right? And you go to the next venue, you go, okay, I have a scotch on the rocks. And you get a scotch on the rocks, and it's 11, 11.45. And then at midnight, you go, can I have another one, please? And they say, no, no, you can only have it if you mix it with a mixer. Yeah. And you yeah. go, but this is really expensive scotch yeah. I'm drinking. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> you've got to mix it with a Coca-Cola. Yeah. And the, the perverse thing about these laws that came in is it, it was, it's illegal to drink a pre-mixed uh, you know, scotch and Coke in a can. It's legal to drink the, um, uh, and it's illegal to drink the scotch after midnight um, uh, if you don't have any coke in it, but you, can only, you can't have it pre-mixed, you've got to have it mixed afterwards. So, so, you, know, so you can't have the pre-mixed in the can, you can't have it pre-mixed, post-mixed, but you can't have the scotch by itself. It's, like, uh, it's just so bizarre. And that combines with, with just the, the, I mean, the general downturn of the nighttime economy. I mean, the city of Sydney published a whole publication on this. They did three reports looking into foot traffic and they were, it was almost like they deliberately designed it so that you couldn't actually correlate any of the yeah. um, data with, it, with the years. Yeah. And they matched March against December in a different year and all this sort of stuff. But the, the gist of the matter is they surveyed people in 2010 and 58% of people out at night were out socialising. They surveyed it again in um, 2015, I think it was, and 57% of people were saying, I'm going home to bed. Yeah. So the people who were out socialising went from 58% of the population to a minority, yeah, right? Yeah. And Sydney now is it's an international joke, basically. It's, yeah, I mean, it is. It's just, it's so for, for those that are unfamiliar with the freelance story, yeah. pre, pre-IPO, I suppose, yeah. what, how, how did it come about? Oh, gee, I mean, it's been published on this, but basically yeah. it's, it's, I used a website, liked it so much I bought it, uh, which was a site called Get a Freelancer. It had a lot of problems with it. It looked like Craigslist. It was, um, but it had a huge amount of activity on it, and this is back in 2009, and... Um, I basically uh, renovated it, right? And uh, you know, fixed up all the problems. Uh, at the time, it looked horrible. People would tell me all these problems with the site. And I'd say, great, can you tell me exactly what the problems are so I can write them down and fix them because I know I can make more money. It was getting a lot of traffic at the time, but it was just poorly monetized. So I built it up over time, um, effectively bootstrapped it. I did raise a little bit of money to, at the very beginning, a couple million bucks to buy the site because mm. um, it was already operating. Mm. I individually run it since 2004. Mm. And um, over time, I you know, managed to build it up, build it up, build it up, and eventually started buying the competitors and you know, bought number eight, number seven, number six, number five, number four, et cetera, and mm. consolidated all together. Mm. Uh, I think we bought about 18 businesses so far. You raised money for the acquisitions? No, cash, all, cash flow, yeah, everything gotcha. is cash. Yep. We actually, we didn't raise any money from the time, we, the day we started the business, we raised I think, two and a half million bucks yep. uh, to buy the original business. And then from that to IPO, we raised zero, mm. right? Mm. And then, so, so initially, uh, Two and a half million dollar business we bought, and then at the IPO we were priced at two hundred million, and then on opening day it actually hit one point oh three billion. So actually no money was raised in between the two and a half. So it's pretty capital efficient. So from two and a half mil to one bill. Yeah, basically. Very capital efficient. Very capital efficient. How's life been as a ASX listed company? Because you, you've been involved in businesses in the past. I understand where VCs involved and all of that sort of stuff. How's life as a listed entity? Um, well, compared to, I mean, a lot of your audience are probably in the sort of startup world. Yeah. Compared to the, the private venture capital, you know, seed investor space, mm. the public company space is significantly easier in my opinion. Mm. And the reason why is um, before this business, I uh, ran a venture back business that um, from 2001 to 2006, we raised, I think, 30 or $40 million in venture capital from nine investors, both Australia and the Silicon Valley globally, mm. Asia. And... Raising money 
and operating under an environment where um, venture capitalists have sort of set all the rules, it was one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life, right? I mean, for example, you go raise money, you've got to go basically beg a whole series of venture capitalists over, mm. you know, over many, many, many months. It can take mm. you six to nine months maybe, or maybe take you 18 months. Mm. Right? I, think, I think the first money we raised took us about 18 months to raise, and it was just woeful. And you're just begging, 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 and then you get around to negotiating, you've got to negotiate a, a telephone directory thick, full of um, uh, documents related to how the company's gonna be run and the shareholders' agreements and right of first refusals and so forth, mm. and very, very complicated terms. Mm. Extremely painful, and um, you know, while we, if you go raise money in the public company sense, all you do is you write a business plan, being a prospectus or a placement document or information memorandum or whatever it may be, and you say this is what I want to do with the money, right? As opposed to VC land, where it's just constantly negotiating. And then mm. the other problem with VC is that the way it's all set up with these preferred stock rights, things like liquidation preference and vetoes and and and, and control thresholds, mm. it makes it extremely difficult for entrepreneurs to run the business. Yeah, right? and because from day one the interests are not aligned, yeah. right? Because the, you know, something like liquidation preference, for example, right? I can put in, I'll give you $2 million for your business as long as, as, long as I go two million, as I go to two times um, participating preferred liquidation preference, which basically means that I put my $2 million in, I get paid back $4 million off the top, and then I share based upon my percentage of shares owned. Mm. And that's just up to some really perverse Mm. behaviors, particularly mm. as that stacks over time with more and more venture capital com coming in, mm. where I've seen businesses where there's been you know, one or $200 million of preferred you know, mm. liquidation preference on top, mm. which means below that, the, the founders get zero if they sell their business. Yeah. Yeah. Zero, right? So it was extremely difficult running a venture-backed business in the public company, the company sense. It's, it's great because it's you know, one share, one vote. Mm. There's no preferred stock. Everything automatically converts on, on IPO. Um, and this is, this is um, universally across all stock exchanges for the most part. Mm except maybe in the US. Um, and it's just very simple, right? You, you know, how, how votes, voting is done, how um, raising money is very simple, clean and efficient. And um, the big difference between venture investors and, and public company investors, if things aren't going well, is if venture capital investors invest in your company, they're stuck for five, six, seven years until they get an exit, right? And so they can, can become control freaks in terms of how they kind of manage, right? Uh, I'm not talking about all VCs, I'm talking about the ones who don't have operating experience in particular, yeah. you know, the yeah. career bankers and so yeah. forth. But it can be a very, very, very troubling. And I'm sure many of your, 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 your viewers have um, experienced bad investors coming mm. in and, mm. and, and it's a complete nightmare. And mm. In fact, I've seen Australian founders who literally have had to go to hospital because they're so stressed because of what the VCs have done that they literally are having you know, palpitations and, and, and so forth. So I've seen some, some horrible behavior. Mm. Well, in the public company sense, if a public company investor doesn't like your stock, they sell it because there's an active, active liquid market, right? So they just find someone and just sell your stock, right? And the stock price might go down, but they, they're out. And you'll see them next week and they'll say, hey, sorry, we just, we just had to change our allocation this quarter. And maybe they come back on again next mm, quarter. Mm, right? Who knows, mm. right? But, but it's generally the interaction you have, I found that, that at least in my experience, that the public company investors that I've met are generally quite helpful, yeah. generally ask interesting questions, have a good conversation. Well, some VCs, they, they jump in and, they, and you know, they can be very much Mm. Yeah. You know, well, what about this? What about that? Because mm. they know it's a six, seven year mm. ride. So, and a lot of the, when, when you speak to a lot of entrepreneurs, they often deter you from going public because of the the, the regulatory environment that you then operate in. But it sounds like in in, in your experience, it hasn't been that prohibitive. Well, in Australia, the, it's actually a pretty good environment. Yeah. Uh, in the US, you have Sarbanes Oxley, and, and and it's it's quite onerous and expensive and mm. so forth. So you'd need to be at a certain scale mm. to be able to do it in the US, to be able to afford all those operating costs. But in Australia, it's extremely, extremely straightforward. Mm. I mean, effectively what the public markets are, is it's, it's crowd, crowdfunding, right? Yeah. So the general public crowdfunds a business, right? Yeah. And in Australia, the market is set up very similar to how the US market was you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Mm. So when Microsoft and Amazon listed, they had market capitalizations around a couple hundred million dollars and so forth, and that's kind of what you kind of see in Australia now, mm, right? Mm. Um, and, you know, it's not like you've got in the US, you've got this perverse environment now where the, the, venture, the venture capitalists now have raised so much money 
that they, they, they need to put huge amounts of money into these um, uh, unicorns mm. because literally otherwise you can't you, you just can't get a return on the, on the amount of money that you have yeah. right and so they're keeping these companies later and later and later um, yeah. private yeah. and they're listing them in, you know, in, the, in the billions tens of billions sort of market cap mm. and so the public market investor the mum and dad can't participate in the in the in the in the, in the, um, the value creation that um, companies like Amazon and Microsoft generate over decades yeah. simply because these companies are coming out with ridiculous valuations. Yeah, yeah. But I would imagine in your shoes it would be really interesting because you've built several successful companies and often from startup or acquisition right through in this case to, to successful mm -hmm. IPO, publicly run company. And you know, you've also done lecturing at Sydney University and StartCon mm -hmm. and you, know, you, you are actively involved in the startups and you do a lot mm -hmm. of give back type stuff. Are there any sort of common mistakes that you see early stage entrepreneurs making, you know, across the board? Oh, where you, <laughs> what are they? <laughs> oh, I could go for you. Uh, for our thesis on this. Um, you Jesus Christ. Uh, look, uh, one thing, and this is a mistake I've made, uh, is some um, founders become too in love with like the technology, and they just go, you know, like my last company, I wanted to, we wanted to build a chip for network security. And why was it a chip? I don't know, we just want to build a chip. That was kind of cool, right? It's scanning network traffic. And, and we were just so focused initially on, you know, on doing that that we didn't really think about you know, what problem we were solving, yeah. right? It was, it was like a solution looking for a problem yeah. rather than a, you know, solving a, a problem yeah. you know, directly. Mm. And you know, you, you've got to solve a problem, right? And so I see that. I mm. see, um, I also see a lot of entrepreneurs, I kind of, I'm probably guilty of this as well. I, I kind of, told a lot of my students when I was teaching entrepreneurship, go out there and take the risk now, you're young, it's easy to go take a risk because you've got nothing to lose, you're poor, you're broke, you don't have a girlfriend or boyfriend, you've got no money, and what's the worst thing that's gonna happen in two years from now, you're poor, you're broke, you don't have a girlfriend, <laughs> and you've got great experience, right? So, but I think in hindsight, that was probably wrong advice. I think probably the better advice is go out and work in a big company for like one or two years, mm. because you'll never do that again for the rest of your life. Mm. Once you go in the startup world, it's mm. very, very hard to kind of go in the corporate world yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and so, um, because you can kind of get hooked on just wanting to start companies and so forth. And yeah. there's a lot of entrepreneurs I see kind of struggle with these very basic things, like yeah. how do I hire someone? How do I fire someone? How yeah. do I remunerate someone? How yeah. do I- um, It's the executive skill set. Just the process, just, a, you, got, you can learn in a big company a lot of process. Mm. There's a really good video on YouTube where Jack Ma talks about what you should do at various stages of your life, yeah. 20, 30, 40, yeah, 50, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I think early on, you, it's actually probably better to get a little bit of experience up front. Yeah, yeah. And then go off and do the startup rather yeah. than go out there and just do the startup straight away. Because mm. I've seen a bunch of people, I've probably been guilty of encouraging them going out at you know 18 years of age or even sometimes dropping out of dropping out of uni, mm. right? Mm. And um, going to start a company and then they kind mm. of struggle later on because they get a lot of they get in the limelight because they get a bit of PR for doing their business mm. and that, mm. and then so they can't go back to uni. Mm. But then they don't really know how to run the business because they've never actually worked in one yeah. that someone else has set yeah. up, yeah. right? So. Absolutely. There's things like that, taking money from the wrong people, just saying, you know, like, like you know, just desperately need the money, just give them the money, I don't, I don't care about the terms, and you know, not reading the terms, and then discovering five years down the track that, that, that it's been set up in such a way that, you know, that it's very hard for the founder to actually make any real, um, get any real value creation out of it, um, taking from the wrong type of investor, um, taking, taking too much money from the wrong type of investors. Uh, diluting too quickly. I mean, I could go on forever yeah. like, on this. If we go back to what you were saying around getting some experience, you know, in, in, a, in a medium to larger size business yeah. early on. Because I've actually thought about that in, in the context of my story a couple of times as yeah. well. Um, the other thing that I often think about, I'd like to get your view on, is because what I imagined the 21 year old response would be, well, I want to build this business and get it to doing revenues where I can employ great executives yeah. and it's this kind of Branson Boris to a degree model where where they're kind of managing it doesn't work like that yeah because the good executives are off doing their own thing right it's impossible for me to hire people with 10 years experience in technology in Australia because the people with 10 years experience in technology are doing their own company or they've left and gone overseas or they've made money and retired or they're doing something else now right so it's impossible you, you can't like it's not like you can go it's not like a I'd love it if it's like a computer game. Like, you know, you're playing a game and you have like a barracks and you hit the button for a soldier and a soldier pops out the other side and you, then you pay for like a commando or something rather and the commando <laughs> pops out and as long as you have the money, they just pop out the other side. It doesn't work like that. 
right? Like it pops out and it's, and it's somewhat dysfunctional. You tell it to go this way, it goes that way. You know, you tell it to go this way, it goes that way for a bit and then gets tired and quits and you know, et cetera. And then yeah. you try and get the commando to come out of the barracks and there's no commandos available, right? And you're like, what do I have to do, right? Like, you know, like, you know, it's a bit like that, right? So um, yeah, no, the, rea the reality is it's very tough to do that because yeah. the people with the, that, that level of experience, well, you know, they're, they're, their talents are fungible, right? Yeah. If they're that good, they can go off and do it themselves. And a yeah. lot of people are now because yeah. it is a, a lot easier to go out there and raise money, start businesses, get customers quickly. I mean, the internet now connects up what, yeah. three or four billion people on the internet. So it's easier to distribute a product or service quickly. So, you know, those, those experienced gray headed executives aren't really around to hide. You mm. might be able to get one or two on the board, mm. right? Or go have coffee and an advisory mm. board, whatever, but you're not gonna be able to go and hire them so easily. Mm. And the ones you do hire won't be very good ones. And do you think that's changed from Branson's day? Because one of the things that I, th and I, incredible amount of respect for Richard, of course, for, for, for what it's done, but, <clears> um, you know, his primary advice, whether you're sitting with him, chatting with him, or whether you're reading his book, or whether you're watching it, his primary advice is, spend a month, find someone else to run your business and then move on to the next one. Whereas I think that's... I, I, I think Branson's it's probably got ADD, I think. Yeah, he <laughs> definitely has ADD. But it's, yeah. it's, it's quite damaging advice. And, and, and if it's a good fantasy, because if it worked like that, it'd be great. It doesn't work like but that. trying to employ that strategy in, in businesses in 2016 can be quite damaging. Well, I mean, you know, I've got four operating businesses under the freelancer group. Freelancer.com is the main business. Mm. And then escrow.com is like the, you know, the eBay and PayPal, or Alibaba and Ali, Alipay. Mm. They're the main businesses I focus on. But we also have Starcom, the conference. We've got Warrior Forum, which is the biggest internet marketing community. I can't get my head. I, the, the cognitive ability for you to get around a portfolio yeah. of businesses is almost impossible, yeah. right? You can do you know, maybe one business great yeah. and another one do okay, right? Um, as a CEO, or you've got to train people up and, and, and do what have you, but you can't really manage multiple businesses at the same time. Mm. Uh, and a bunch of people who kind of, there's another, another bunch of people I kind of, you meet around town occasionally, you say, yeah, I've got like, I'm running 10 startups at the same time, they're doing this, 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 this. And that means they're doing 10 things badly, I think, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, not, you know, I agree. The, 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 the big success you get is by doing, you know, building one business and building it great. Right? Amen. Yeah. Amen. Love that. Rosie, how are we doing for time? Are we are not going well for time, guys. I did warn Rosie before we went live that Matt and I would probably talk for a very long time. <laughs> we and over we did. Time already. <laughs> and I have not asked a single audience Give us question. The two okay. or three best questions from the audience. Okay, fine. First one comes from Keely. She says, Hi, Jack. Hi, Matt. Given the success of sites like Freelancer, what do you think are the most important skills to learn for future success? And what do you think future jobs will look like? Well, I could write a thesis in response to that. Um, Look, I think it's, I'm very biased. I'm a technologist. I did engineering and computer science at university. I think, in my opinion, if I was starting off right now and thinking about what skills to learn, I would go and do a computer science or electrical engineering degree um, just because you get the technical depth and background um, and the building blocks in terms of analytical thinking in order to understand technology, understand how it works, which means that you may not be working in technology later on. I don't write any code anymore. They don't let me write any code. And if they do, they call it founder code because they find it and they rip it out. <laughs> uh, I stole that from Mike and Brooks. But, um, but uh, what they do, you know, but it gives you the ability to hire people who are technologists, attract them to join you and so forth. There's a lot of people, you know, knacking around sort of incubators going, I need a co technical co-founder, I need a technical co-founder. And it's very, very difficult for them because, the, you know, again, the, the value, the, you get a bit of asymmetry occurring where if they're really, really good technical people, they can really call the shots and do their own thing and it's very hard for the person who wants to start the business to actually you know, retain control or, yeah. or manage it without yeah. the tech person just taking over and just doing their own thing. Yeah. So, yeah. so you know, my bias would be go out there and, and, and do a technical degree. It could be anything really technical, STEM, mm. science, mm. technology, engineering, mathematics, mm. that kind of spectrum, mm. but uh, understand technology because then when you come out, your brain's programmed in the right way to mm, kind of mm, think about mm, these sort of it. things. And the great thing about technology is that it's inherently entrepreneurial because you, you, you're doing, doing new things, so it's yeah. new products and new services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From the education standpoint, I come at it from a slightly different angle in that I would be, I, I think education going forward will develop to a high degree around emotional intelligence and how we deliver, teach, and enable people to learn, right? IBM do a CEO study once every year, it might even be biannually around, you know, they speak to the top 1,000, 1,500 CEOs in the world and they go, what are the number one 
attributes that you look for in your people? Well, that, that's the question I asked in 2012. And the answer was adaptability to change and creativity in developing new ideas. So I think the future of work and the future of education will be more slanted to a holistic approach that involves the human being as well as the skills. Open my chakras. <laughs> Open the chakras. <laughs> <laughs> One more question, Rosie. This is quite a big question. We've okay. got like three to five minutes. Okay, this one comes from William. Jack and Matt, what would you suggest for getting some key meetings? What would you suggest to do for getting some key meetings with large capital groups to be able to get some good feedback on your business model or company? I found these meetings very difficult to set up. And I'd like to know if you have any resources for connecting with these groups for pre raise so, meetings. Capital groups, you mean like, uh, yeah, like investors? Yeah, investors, mm. yeah. So how, how, how do you get meetings with investors? Yeah. Okay. Well, okay, I worked as a venture capitalist for a short amount of time, and I'll tell you kind of what it's like being a venture capitalist. So I was fresh out of grad school, came to Australia, worked for a boutique fund, small number of, I think, three partners. Every day you, I, I got, got, to, got to work, my inbox had like 100 business plans, and I'd kind of wade through it all, and I'd go, oh, there's some interesting things here, and that's kind of interesting, and that's kind of interesting, whatever, and, and so forth. And, um, you know, uh, every day, 100 more, and we would fund none of them, not one, right? Uh, because we'd fund two businesses per year, mm. and the two businesses a year that we'd fund came through an introduction yep. or a connection or whatever. Through so you know, one of the partner's friends goes, we're gonna do this investment, we need a co-investor, can you join with us, we'll look at it, etc." Because literally, working, you know, in an, in, if you're working as a venture capitalist, you, you, you just literally just get PowerPoints just spraying at you through the you know, email. Mm. Mm. And you, it's just overwhelming. You just literally can, you don't have the cognitive overhead to be able to look through them all. And, 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 and it's bizarre. You, you'd find a few businesses go, this kind of actually looks pretty good. You know, this is great, whatever. But you'd find none of these businesses mm. because it's all about personal connections. So the, the, the trick is you kind of need to find you know, someone. Well, my first advice to you is actually not to raise any money at all. My first advice to you is to go and well, raise it effectively from the best place possible, which is by selling something useful to customers and in the form of revenue. And then you retain 100% and you master your own destiny. But if you do need to raise money, make sure you, you know, raise it from uh, investors with good operating experience. But to, to get to them, you need to find a way to get instruction, right? If you just cold call or just spray and pray your, your, your PowerPoint out, you won't get anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Particularly if, I get the sense that this guy is young. I don't know how I got that sense from that yeah. particular the question. Cap, the, cap, the capital. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> capital group, yeah. The meeting with the capital yeah. people. Um, and so I, I would suggest that at, at that stage of the game, you might not necessarily want to speak to venture capitalists or PE guy or even angel investors at that point, right? Go and find people with a little bit of business experience that have proven results and have demonstrated success and chat to them about your idea because what you don't want to do is go and chat to the four or five good VCs in town or whatever it might yeah. be. When, when you don't actually have a fundamental business case that's ready to go. Yeah. So those aren't the doors that you should be starting with. You should be starting at StartCon or UnCon or... Yeah, exactly. And it, it start doing pitching competitions yeah. and you get feedback from the judges at the pitching competitions, right? And there's pitching competitions every, every week in the city, right? Uh, everywhere, yes. right? And then you get a bit of feedback and so forth. And the trick with it, if you do want to raise money, the trick is you don't pitch the best investor first. Yeah you find the dumbest, ugliest investor you can possibly find and you pitch them first, right? And the reason why is the first time you pitch an investor, you're gonna be nervous. Yeah. You won't know all the answers to all the questions. Yes. You're not quite sure about the model because the first time you pitched it, right? But if it's the dumbest, ugliest investor that you hate and you'll never ever raise money from ever, that you will be confident, you get all the answers, you get all the questions, right? You won't have all the answers, you look like an idiot, but you don't care because it's the worst investor ever possible. And you, so you're going, yeah, that's fine. I didn't want to raise me from them anyway. And then you go home and you go, well, what were the questions he asked me? Well, okay, let's do some research on that. Are these, you know, reasonable concerns? What's the answers? And you come up with some answers. Then you find the second ugliest investor, right? And you go pitch them. And they ask you some questions. And you give, you've got a few of the answers now because you've thought about it a little bit more, right? You go away and you go, well, I don't care. I didn't want to raise money from me either because they're the second ugliest investor. Then you go to the third ugliest investor. Right, and so on and so forth. By the time you actually get round to the guy you want to raise, or girl you want to raise money from, yeah. right, you've got all the, all the questions can be, there's a finite set of questions, trust me. I mean, I've run lots of businesses. There's a finite set of questions people can really ask mm, you, mm. right? You've got all the answers, it mm. rolls off the tongue, you can get mm. the presentation without the PowerPoint. Mm. You're very confident, you're natural, you're on your, you know, on, your, you know, on your feet, and so forth, and then you'll knock it out of the park. 
Absolutely. Getting some good feedback from William. He says he's 30 and crossing over 150k rev. But he says, thanks for the great feedback. Really loving this. Love cool. that. Thanks, thanks Will. Mm -hmm. Matt, uh, talk to us about StartCon. Yes. It's awesome. It's not just awesome, it's incredible. <laughs> it's not just awesome, it's incredible. So it's, we run um, Australia's largest startup and growth conference. And for those people who don't know what growth is, this is basically internet marketing, right? But it's how, how to rapidly grow your revenue, right? And um, this conference has been run for six years. Uh, it used to be called Sid Start, for those of you who remember Sid Start years and years mm. and years ago. Mm. Um, this year it's called StartCon because we're taking the next level. Mm. Uh, 3,000 people attend and we're flying probably one of the best contingents of experienced Silicon Valley tech uh, mm. executives that Australia's ever seen. Mm. We've got Andrew Chen from Uber. He's written about 900 essays on growth and how to market your business and so forth. Mm. We've got um, the head of growth from Pinterest. Uh, we've got you know, senior people from everywhere from Zillow, which is the largest online real estate company in the US, mm. right through to you know, BitTorrent, HubSpot, you name it, 500 startups and so on. It is an absolutely action-packed yeah. you know, uh, yeah. cast of speakers. Yeah. 3,000 people, Ramwick Race Course, November 26 and 27. Um, we've got all sorts of really fun things happening on the day. There's a hackathon. We can code for Australia and you can try and uh, write code to develop and solve problems that Australia is facing. There's a capture of the flag. So for those of you into internet security, we have to kind of break into all these systems and, and hack your way in. And That's there's, great. I think it's like $15,000 prize money for that. Um, there's uh, a whole range of really fun events, like there's, there's parties, there's uh, you name it. It's like we've got the whole, we booked the whole of the, the race course out and we run a few, a few other places around the, around the city, various venues. Mm. But um, 26th and 27th of, of November, yeah. and it is absolutely phenomenal, yeah. right? Yeah. The main thing about this conference is when you walk out, the way we've designed it, there's no boring panel sessions where it's like question, 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 that's it. It's all about actionable insights. It's all mm. about mm. You know, whether you're a, 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 a sole entrepreneur, a startup, or even working in a corporate or in a marketing team somewhere, these are there are ways in which every time you come out of a session that you can apply to your business mm. to make the revenue go to the next level, mm. right? Mm. Uh, so it's absolutely phenomenal. Startcon.com, and because Jack's such a good negotiator, he's <laughs> he's true. managed to he's managed to twist our arm and and get a discount for uh, your listeners. Yeah, for the entourages. So guys, as Matt says, November 26th and 27th, make sure you get there. From the caliber of speakers these guys have, Uber, Pinterest, BitTorrent, SurveyMonkey, it is seriously an effective way to grow your skill set and grow your knowledge base as an entrepreneur. Now, tickets are normally $4.99. I am a good negotiator. For you guys, uh, StartCon and Matt are able to do them for $3.99, provided you use the discount code ENTOURAGE. Rosie will put a link in the comments below on both videos. No, you won't pay $4.99, you'll pay $3.99 as an Entourage discount using the discount code Entourage. So make sure you do that. I'll be there as well. Of course you will. Just from what you it's just not, said. Everyone's going to be there. Ev fun. Everybody is going to yeah. be there. Matt, so. thank you so much for coming in. I appreciate this. Yes. I'm loving my new hat already. My girlfriend is going to hate it, but she'll just have to put up with it. You can buy that hat if you want uh, from makesydneylateagain.com. Make Sydney it's not me. I, I, I found the, found the <laughs> website. I thought it was funny. <laughs> Matt, thank you very Matt, much. Appreciate you being here. Great, Cheers. thank you.